Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Anton. I'm going to talk a bit about observability. I think I'm a bit late to the trend. Um, I think the buzz is uh, kind of dying out a bit. But that's actually a good thing because then uh, observability can become this boring thing that is easy to understand and not as uh, buzzy as it was uh, a year or two ago. Uh, before I introduce myself and my approach to this, uh, just a quick poll to understand uh, the blend of audience uh, that is attending today. Um, a few general questions. So how many of you feel comfortable with differences between monitoring and observability, instrumentation, all these, uh, all these words? Okay, good. So uh, you're, you're in the right place. I hope to, uh, to clear the fog on this a bit. Uh, another question, how many people here um, would identify themselves as working on a SaaS offering rather than an on-prem solution? Um, okay, so uh, not, not too many. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and one last question uh, would be maybe the operational stack. Uh, how many people here identify more uh, with uh, microservices architectures and uh, spend their time, uh, their work time with that versus a monolith application? Okay, more hands in the air. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, um, my name is Anton. Um, I'm the VP Engineering of SNCC. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the company. Uh, my slides are going to be mainly a reminder for me, nothing much for you to read. Didn't invest in, uh, you know, emojis or uh, memes or all that stuff. So, uh, like I said, boring is good. It's going to be a bit boring. Um, I actually have uh, one or two slides with code on them, so uh, six or five lines, but uh, we'll walk through that. Uh, the most interesting part awaits those uh, who will be patient enough and will wait until the end of the presentation, where I will actually do some live demos um, on um, how we employ our solution for observability and what we can get from it. The first thing is some context. What I'm going to, to share here is based a lot on our personal, personal experience as a team at SNCC and is not easily copy-pastable to any other organization. So just a few buzzwords about what is it that we do and how we do it. Uh, we're, um, we're a young company. Uh, we're a dev tooling company operating in the security and open source space, um, which, makes, uh, which makes it a very easy for us to adopt relevant technologies because our business domain is very, is very technological. Um, we're building a SaaS offering. Uh, it is based on uh, a Kubernetes uh, um, cluster. Node.js and Python are the main languages uh, in the microservices stack. Okay? So whenever you see something, hear something, and you say, hey, how come it works for them? Maybe it wouldn't work for us um, at the company you work at. Um, try to ask yourself whether this is your reality or not. I would like to assume that what I'm going to share is applicable to wider audiences than, uh, than the operation we run. Uh, but I really urge you to ask questions, uh, interrupt me like half th halfway through um, if, if, if anything is unclear. This is the most graphical slide you'll see on, on, my, on my presentation. And uh, I want to see a few hands who um, get warm and fuzzy associations seeing this picture. OK, very good. So the audience is, uh, is right. Uh, and I want to, um, for those born like later, um, this is a very old game called Lemmings. Uh, and I'm going to use this as an analogy for what observability means to me. Um, in this game, this is, by the way, the first stage, the easiest stage, um, you need to set up uh, this maze in a way that will allow the lemmings, as they pour into the, uh, into the scene uh, through this opening, to get to the exit. And the lemmings are quite silly. They only do what you tell them to do. And another thing about them is that they are always moving. They're not waiting for you to order. Uh, they begin walking. Uh, the thing here is that <clears throat> you need to choose the digger uh, role and assign it to one lemming so that they dig a hole through. And then all the lemmings end up uh, in the right place. Should some lemmings walk in the wrong direction, they will walk all the way left here. There is a wall here, and they will walk back in and, uh, and exit the stage. Your goal on, in this game is to uh, get as many, uh, as many lemmings uh, as you can safely from the entrance to the exit. What does this have to do with anything, right? It's a, it's a very nice game with very complex stages down the road. But uh, it is very relevant because each such stage is basically an application, and those lemmings can be requests coming in, and your code is going to run and handle these requests as they, as they go. 
But um, you don't control how many requests you get, and you want to get more, right? You're growing, and you want to have proper responses to your requests. You want each request to be handled properly throughout the stage you've set, the code, and uh, HTTP 200, that's, that's the exit gate, right? You want to send the, send the response that was expected. And to me, observability is designing to testability in production, understanding what is really going to happen outside of your dev environment. Take care of all the lemmings. You need to build a service and feel safe about its ability to withstand the load and complexity and whatnot. But also care for the individual lemming, because that customer who is not going to get what they wanted from your service is going to open a support ticket and say, at this approximate date and time, I clicked that button and everything crashed. And you would really want to know what happened with their specific request. To those familiar with the game, there's this uh, explosion icon here. Sometimes requests will just explode. So what you gain when you have proper observability, and this is like the best definition I can give, is proper fast troubleshooting. No more, there's this support case that has been going around the team for weeks. No one knows what to do with it, but we cannot just go back to the customer and say we don't yet know. Uh, taking the pain and cooling off this hot potato. Um, the data you have on your system becomes very trustworthy and serves as a single source of truth. No more, I'm seeing these numbers, okay, but I'm seeing numbers that completely contradict what you're seeing. We have a problem somewhere. And the last and most important part is a scientific approach to changes. We are making changes in our system all the time. We're deploying features, we are fixing bugs. Observability is the difference between shipping it out there to see what happens versus knowing what to expect once the change gets shipped. And that's a very, very important change. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing quite a good job explaining why this is uh, the heaven we all want. Uh, so why aren't we there already? Like, if, if it all makes sense, why didn't we just build it? Um, I, I see a few problems, okay? When you're just starting out, the last thing you want to take care of is something that is not a new feature, right? You have this project which is two or three days old, and you have so much ideas around what it can do. The last thing you're going to invest in is teaching it how to talk back to you and provide you with these insights. You just want to ship out features and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and scope. But time goes by. You take a look back and you say, oh no, what have I created? This unmanageable piece of code that does a lot of things, only I remember roughly how requests are being handled and what their flow is. Now is a very bad time to start introducing something that will allow that level of visibility for re re reliable data and the source of truth and, uh, and all, all that I mentioned. And this is, I think, the main reason why Sometimes we feel this is simply too good to be true, and it cannot happen. It's either too soon or too late. What's the right time to do it? What tools exist that can actually help me? Um, it's all a blur. And this is where I get to the technical part. So my solution to observability, and there are plenty of amazing tools out there, but my solution is very, very simple. It is based on logs. Logs do not have very good karma. And we usually think about them when we say, I couldn't reproduce the issue, I will just add more logs and push them to production and see what that gets me, okay? They tend to become meaningful only to the person who wrote them. Uh, they tend to become outdated two days after they've been written and used for the troubleshooting case they were introduced for. And um, it becomes a pile of junk, okay? Uh, a quote I saw on some blog is uh, something along the lines of, um, logs is where strings is where data goes to die. Okay, nothing like ever comes out of there. So I'm suggesting a different approach to this, and I'm going to list uh, six or seven steps that we've taken over the last three years in our company that have brought us to what I think is a very good place uh, we should all strive to be in. Uh, we used logs to do this, and I'll I'll make some references to to the technical sides of. Uh, uh, of what it meant for us. But the first step, and this is not just like a programmer's joke with step zero, this is prior to the first step, 
you need to understand that this is a mindset, okay? It is not a single person's job to just say, hey, I did this thing, only I know how, how it was done. No one needs to understand it. It will just work for the rest of us. It needs to be a team effort. Make sure that if you feel energized after this talk and you feel this future is within reach, do talk to your team about it and make sure that you are all committed to this process because it's a process. It's not a two minute work or uh, two days of work and, uh, and everything's done. Our take on this, and this will repeat on uh, all the slides uh, as I want to make uh, as much references to, to our uh, internal experience with this, is that we invest in this a lot, okay? Our training, onboarding new hires to the team has a very long chapter on, on how we do logging and how it helps us. Code reviews would sometimes go like comment after comment on, but are we logging this specific case in the right way to help us so that once something does happen in production, we will not say, oh, we wish we have had these logs. We will already have them in place. And on-call. On-call is a on-call rotation. We run on the team. Every developer participates. Um, our logging is, a number, is the number one tool we, we use when we want to troubleshoot something. And even if you don't contribute much to uh, logging in your new code base, you will get familiar with the power of logging, the way it's being used the moment you go on call. The first step is to decide where to keep them, okay? We're thinking about the end, end game here and not, okay, I will just start logging things in the way I do now. Buy it if you can and build it if you must is, is a very important philosophy for a lot of things here included. Logging is a generic need. It's a problem you have very little uniqueness about, okay? It's been solved by many other people for many other use cases. Try to find something that fits your size. It is very tempting to run your own ELK stack or I don't know what, don't do it. You've been hired to move your company forward. And this is a tool that will help you. This, may, this must not become the product itself. If you end up having one or two people on a team of 10 or 20 constantly worrying about the usability of this infrastructure, you took a wrong turn, okay? And I, I, this, is, this is something very dear to me. Uh, the end goal is for developers to be very efficient with their time. If it costs you one or two developers for the rest to be efficient with their time, efficiency is in question. Big shout out to Logs.io. We are very happy customers. They're sponsoring this event. Um, we are using them as a, as a managed service, as a managed DLK, not to care about all the complexities of running our own. Uh, we're pushing about 15 gigabytes of text uh, of logs daily. Uh, we've, we've grown from nothing to 15. Uh, we're not the largest, <coughs> sorry, we're not the largest customers of Logs.io. Uh, this is our experience. We find the headache being taken care of by someone else very refreshing, allowing us to focus on, on what's important. The second step is, okay, now you have this thing working for you. Let's start shipping logs somewhere, okay? How do we do this? Uh, how many of you are familiar with the 12 factors uh, thing? Like, uh, okay, very good. So it's a set of uh, architectural rules for what makes a good application. Rule number, number 11 out of, these 12s, uh, out of these 12 talks about logs. And it basically says, logging is a, is a big thing. Your application needs to do very little about it. Pour them to STD out and let something else take care of this rotating files, formatting your logs, buffering, all of that, it, it, it quickly become, becomes a very big uh, uh, complex task. Uh, don't be caught uh, by surprise uh, if you choose to take care of this yourself. All our microservices are dumping their logs to STD out and we have other things uh, letting us uh, uh, control them. I'll get to that in a second. Um, choose a logging library, okay, uh, tons of those exist, Bunyan is our choice, um, there's a, it's a JavaScript clone, it also exists for Python, it is very efficient, um, it uses uh, single line JSONs which are bad for humans, very good for machines, um, so we use that. And uh, we use FluentD daemons uh, on our Kubernetes cluster to push the logs, so the part taking care of what happens after the log has been printed is very thin very tailor-made to the indexing service that we use. JSONs work well, being parsed in Elasticsearch. I don't need to sell, sell you on this. 
This is our choice. There are many other solutions. You can use Splunk, you can use uh, Logly or whatnot. Um, make your choice. But these are really the building blocks and the technical decisions you need to make. Once you've made the external technical decisions of where is it that I'm pushing my logs and what library I chose to do it, comes the hard part. And this is really the hard part, okay? You need to have your logs structured. No more very long strings with very various uh, replacements, you know, percent %s for this, percent %s for that. This is a very quick way of making sure the logs will be relevant only to the person who wrote them in the first place. If you want logs that can help you answer questions that you don't even know how to ask right now, you're, you won't be able to foresee the next like production outage or uh, some functional problem, you need to structure your logs. Coming back to step zero, this is the, way, the, 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 the point in time where the team commitment to working this way is now being applied by everyone for everyone. All the logs needs, need to be structured. What does it mean? It basically means that you need to push context objects and not strings that encapsulate a lot of, uh, a lot of data in them. I will show that on one of the next slides with, uh, with some code. The logging level, right? You sometimes see like code uh, calling out to info and fatal and error and trace and debug and you're like, who needs that? Like, there is, there, is, there is a signal being sent here. Someone chose to use the debug level and not the info level. What did they mean? This is all part of the context. You need to choose very precise rules and make very few decisions. Limit the, the choices that you make so that uh, the signals you send uh, are very sensible to someone who has never written a line of code in this microservice, but is now debugging it because they are on call and something went wrong. Special treatment for errors, maybe we'll, uh, we'll get to this later. So, as I promised, the first example of code, right? Um, this is JavaScript. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, I think it's uh, still easy to read. So the first thing we do, we say, let's log this at the info level, okay? The choice of the log level is an important signal. We use info to indicate that things are happening as planned, okay? That would be that lemming falling down a, a, a shaft you just dug out because you intended for that to happen. And, you will, and the, lem the lemming will just say, I'm now falling down the shaft that was just dug out and I measured some temperature along the way. It took me uh, this much milliseconds to do so. Uh, I'm carrying these parameters on my request and that's about it, okay? So the object you see here with these three keys is the context that is always going to change. Different lemmings are going to fall at different times, different speeds, going to measure different temperatures, I don't know what. But this second argument here is going to be a constant string. Avoid using varying values in this string, okay? This is a poor, poor man's solution to having your code not instrumented to the point of stopping, but at the same time being able to just find a line of log in your logging and say, hey, where does this come from in the code? And just search it in your code base. This is human readable. This has like high entropy, if you will, unique enough not to repeat too often, and basically describes what operation took place and what values, key value pairs, basically, uh, were collected during this operation. Looks easy enough, right? So use this on step zero and say, hey, we're not, we're not going uh, anywhere far. This is going to be easy. Our take on this. So we use standard logged keys to match common objects. So all of us have the user object in our system. All of us have the purchase object, subscription object, I don't know what. It really draws a very coherent line across your microservices. A user in one microservice and the user is another are usually the same thing. It makes a lot of sense. Logging at specific checkpoints and on response. A very slim microservice would only log on response to just indicate that it has completed handling a, a single request. And this is all the metadata, all the key value pairs that were collected throughout the handling of this request. More complex monolithic microservices will introduce several checkpoints and say, I want to do this here. I want to tell about an event that is now happening here. The logging level matches HTTP status codes. Our microservices are very HTTP oriented. Uh, we always count the HTTP 200s, 400s, and 500s, and we correlate them to log levels. So if I'm going to respond with 
this is what you asked for, here's the response, HTTP status code will be 200 and the log level will be info. If I'm encountering an error, which I believe to be on my side, because on the server side I failed to do something, the HTTP status code will be 500 and the log level will be error. Okay, and this is something that once observed clearly in logs becomes very, very helpful. I mentioned the reverse lookup, so the ability to copy a line from, from your logs and immediately understand the line of code that generated it is really, really helpful. And um, one last thing about error messages, so sometimes your error object would have a message saying, I just exploded at something, like I made a request to an external service but it timed out. And you would also want to indicate on the log what kind of user operation has failed because of this specific timeout. So there, are, there is room for two, uh, two string messages in terms of errors. Do not, do not make the mistake of, of uh, combining them in a single one. I'm going to speed up a bit because I really want to get to the technical part. Um, uh, protecting your logs, okay, so GDPR, uh, stuff like that. Um, once your logs are structured, it becomes much easier to sanitize them, okay? And we employ some basic sanitation inside our logging library, which is a wrapper around Bunyan. Uh, we are masking out uh, what we believe to be authentication tokens, because users grant us with authentication tokens to other services we need to connect to on their behalf. Uh, as well as email addresses, so emails are not really important, but are really sensitive, especially in your logs. Uh, that's a good way to, to avoid having them leak. Um, we did ex experience some major problems once we began logging huge objects without realizing we're doing that, okay? So dumping an object into your log and only then realizing it was an ORM object and with many related objects and some uh, database connection string data, which needed to be sanitized, um, can really halt uh, services with the amount of I.O. used to just pump data to, to, to STD out. Um, a proper logging library makes it very easy to trim long fields in one specific place and not go on a never-ending hunt of uh, each, each line that is being logged. Make logging easy, okay? So uh, uh, the steps up until now are more about the introduction of we don't do it properly, but let's try it this way. So four steps so far. This is the step that becomes relevant a year into the making of this, uh, which makes it very, um, very easy for new people to just use logging as a framework in your code. Um, one log per request is a, is a great place to start at, okay? But you want to log everything, okay? And this is a change in, in perception, I think. Usually people would say, I will just log an exception in my catch block, or I don't know what. Uh, but logging each and every request really allows a lot of visibility um, into what's, uh, what's really happening. So if I'm logging just once per request, what do I do along the handling of this request? Just collect the, bread, br the breadcrumbs, okay? Carry with you this log context object that you add keys to it each time you encounter an important event in the processing of your request, and then push it to STD out uh, upon response. Um, please remember this, like the link. Um, it's a very like a standalone uh, implementation of uh, um, of how logging is used in our boilerplate code as an infrastructure. And this is the second code slide, which is actually an excerpt, uh, the, the, the core of, uh, of that repository you can look at. So uh, again, uh, JavaScript expressed this, uh, this time, so if you don't know what await next is, I'll get to it in a second. Uh, we're beginning with declaring a logging function, which we initialize to the info level, because we expect things to go smoothly, right? We also ca capture the timestamp of beginning the handling of the request. This try and catch, uh, this try block is actually saying, I'm just a middleware that is meant to do this and this, and the actual handling of the request happens elsewhere. So let's just handle the request, okay? Uh, a Python example would say, do work, okay? So this is the area where the request actually gets handled. All its uh, breadcrumbs, events are getting collected, whatnot. If an exception occurs during the handle, handling of the event, 
we internally in our systems have a standard where each error carries a code key, which is basically the HTTP status code that needs to be returned. For example, basic input validation will detect that we were expecting a JSON payload, but we got something which is unparsable. So that would be a 400 error, right? Because the client sent us something we don't understand. But if we tripped over a null pointer exception or tried to access undefined something, then it would be our error, and the response code would be 500. The logging function now changes, and it will be warning or error depending on the value of the return code. Since an error happened, I want to capture it in my log context object. It is pinned on the request, which means it is fully usable by whatever handling actually took place but I'm carrying it with me now. And finally, either nothing bad happened or an exception happened, I'm going to add the duration as yet another key because I know when I started and I'm about to send a response and I'm going to use whatever log function was decided on to log the context and saying, I'm sending the repl a reply to a request. What happened on this request? I don't know, let's look in the log, at the log context object. Okay, so this is a quick walk, walkthrough of what took us uh, a few good iterations to focus on. Uh, it's not the only way to do logging, but it's our way. Uh, what about, uh, the okay, so the question is, what do we do when during the handling of a request, we lose track of the request object, so we cannot populate the log context, and we have something important to note. It's a pain point. It's, um, uh, the pain point is close to that of uh, proper traceability when the same request gets handled by different microservices and you want to correlate them all to the same request ID or whatnot. Um, I don't have a good answer to this. I will just say that you need to keep track of the log context object as deep as it makes sense. You don't need to push it down your stack to each and every library and function. But a lot of, if you expect a library to sometimes succeed and sometimes fail, then the, the point in time where you call out to this library needs to either have this log context available so you can keep track of what happened, or you can just throw an exception in, an, in, in a case of failure. And then this exception or error will be added here. So this kind of solves 80% of the problem for us right now, but it really is a problem. Okay, we're getting close to the end. I will just mention that uh, one major drawback of this uh, approach is scale, okay? Logging a single line, which can be quite long, think about the size of uh, this JSON object, uh, per request is going to be big, okay? And this is how we get to 15 gigabytes per day today. Um, what we, um, we are currently at this level, we're employing skipping, so when a very boring service uh, has 99% success rate on its calls, we simply don't log the HTTP 200s. We only log the problems. Um, and uh, that helps uh, handle scale. The next step, which we're not at yet, uh, is to sample logs and generate a log for every X requests. And it can be for every 100 um, HTTP 200s, I'm going to log once. For every 20 client errors, for every 20 HTTP 400, I'm going to log once. And for every HTTP 500, I'm going to log once because I'm weighted towards, uh, towards my errors. That's like a basic sampling approach that can really help deal with scale. Scale is not just a technical issue, as uh, was pointed out uh, earlier today on the keynote. And it really requires constant oversight as your code base grows, new microservices get created, a good approach is to, is to plant the right seeds with your boilerplate, make sure that logging is easy to use, uh, but also focus on this in reviews. Suddenly logging becomes a very important functional thing for the team and it's not like, I just logged it this way, it's for me, like why are you even commenting on this? Let's, let's review the, the, the logic. Code is logic, uh, logging is, is logic. Customer success and sales engineering in our organization are uh, uh, very good users, external users to our logging. As it is a source of truth for the organization, we have a lot of analytic solutions and all of that. It has a lot of, I, I don't want to say we don't need that, but the fact we can talk about the same thing and say if, it's, if it happened, it will be logged, 
is a very, very strong, um, strong assumption for, uh, for our mutual work outside of the engineering organization. A quick summary of the stages. Do not forget this. Do not skip this. If you're extremely motivated by what I said and tomorrow morning you're going to dump your sprint plan and introduce logging, you're doing it wrong. Talk to your team first. Structuring your logs is the busiest part, is the one that is most ongoing and requires constant, uh, constant upkeep, but it is really, really worth it. Eventually, your team will operate in a different way. Okay, um, I'm, I'm almost on time. So now I would like to show you a few, uh, a few dashboards and... Uh, okay, so a, a really quick overview. Um, this is a view of things that are being logged. I'm now querying for all the logs sent by a specific microservice in our stack. Uh, production data, okay, so I'm not going to increase the font because you're not supposed to see the numbers. But I will say that here I'm seeing a line of log per request being served. And as you, you saw before, prior, I'm um, so about 43,000 hits in the past 24 hours. Uh, and I'm now going to see just the slow responses. So whenever the duration is above three seconds, um, this view immediately shows me that out of the 43,000 um, requests served in the past 24 hours, only 560 took over three seconds. And maybe this is important information, and maybe it's meaningless today, and it will be extremely important tomorrow. We always go back in time and check for it. Some more graphical stuff. Logging this duration allows us to transcend to the, uh, to the, to the area of percentiles and let go of the problematic averages. So this would be a graph of the 99th, 95th, and median percentiles of how long did it take us to respond to requests on this service at any given slot in time. Um, if things are becoming slow, you will, see it you will see it immediately. Remember my reference to scientifically making changes to your, to your uh, code? So if you're working on a performance improvement and you don't have this graph to start with, stop working on the improvement. You would not know what impact it made. You need to measure this up front. Another quick view, okay, this time is uh, counting the responses by the log level. Remember, info is HTTP 200, warning is 400, and error is 500. So you will see that the majority are 200 and everyone's happy, but here we had a spike of purple, and these are 535 requests that uh, uh, got the response of 403 this time. 403, okay, an authentication issue. So that can really help in troubleshooting. This is um, a rip off of, of an analytics solution, okay, and allows us to see, uh, for example, that Node V8 is the most popular pl platform uh, on which our CLI is currently running, and Linux takes about a third, but Windows 10 is on the rise, okay, so maybe we want to prioritize Windows testing. Uh, for our new features. Last but not least, I will jump straight to this one. This is the number one dashboard we use. It collects errors happening in our system. Errors happen all the time. If errors are not happening for you, it's only because you're not looking in the right places. So last four hours, we experienced 332 errors in the system, and they are broken down by which Kubernetes po pod or node they originated on, allowing us to find problematic like physical platform problems, as well as identify what's on the rise, what's changing, uh, track the success of our deployments. That's me. I hope this was helpful. Please ask questions.